this is Sean Harwell. You're listening to the Never Heard of It podcast, episode 38.5, and I am joined today, as always, by Mr. Doctor. I'm just waiting to see how long it'll go on. Uh, philanthropist. That's it, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> that is me. Craig Moorhead. Uh, and this is the podcast where we talk about the movies that have fallen through your cracks, but today is a mini episode. That's what the point five means. So uh, in this case, we'll be talking about things you probably have already heard about. It's the slider to the other cheeseburger yeah. episodes. Full, like a quarter That's a, that's a good way to look at it. One of which was episode 38, where we talked about the 2016 documentary Nuts by Penny Lane. And if you haven't had a chance to check that episode out, I highly recommend you do. And I highly recommend you watch that movie. It's pretty fascinating Agreed. stuff. You can find all those at NeverHeardPodcast.com. Find us on Twitter at NeverPodcast. And then all our social links, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, are visible on our website and obviously through Google. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, you know what? We actually had a request for the mini episodes, which, you know, I don't think we've ever put it out there that you people can request stuff for us to talk about because I, I didn't imagine that there were things that, you know, they were dying to hear uh, us, us debate upon. But, you know, this one has probably been on the, the, the minds of, of many a Star Wars fan. And by that, I think that means much of the population, since apparently much of the population did, in fact, see Rogue One, a Star Wars story. And that is this issue of the CGI... <laughs> character of, of of Mr. Tarkin, played by Peter Cushing in the original Star Wars movie, who you may remember when we talked about nothing but the night, but but he's he's dead, Craig. Wait, what? Yeah, he's he's really dead. And uh he really looks like he's in, in a Rogue One <laughs> a little bit younger than he was, in fact, in in A New Hope. And of course they did not reanimate his body, but they did animate his face using CGI. You know, I, I looked this up a little bit to at least educate myself. They did have the cooperation of his estate to do this. And the people speaking about it that worked on this movie, who were quoted in this article, said that they know that Peter Cushing was very proud of his involvement in the original Star Wars film. He wanted to be in, in other ones and was, was sad that George Lucas had more or less killed off that character. And uh, they think that it is something that he would have given his blessing to. Craig, your thoughts? <sighs> Just slap me in the face with him. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Um, what it reminds me of is, I want to say a long, long time ago. In a galaxy far away. No, there was, I want to say it was a Coca-Cola commercial that used Humphrey Bogart in the commercial. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember this, this same conversation kind of being brought up then as well, which is, you know, is this... Is this really okay? Uh, I think they actually used his likeness in a Tales from the Crypt episode as well. I mean, yeah, I, I guess it, it definitely opens a can of worms, and I don't know what kind of laws there are about it. Um, it seems like it should be something where, you know, if... if I was going to say, is your face intellectual property? Well, right, right. And it, well, and it's not, right? Because yeah. uh, Crispin Glover proved that. Correct. Back to the Future too. But you know, do, do, does it need to? Be, do you need to assign someone to be the custodian of your work? You know, if we have this technology, if somebody wants to use your likeness in a movie, you know, they can go to your family and say, "Would he have approved this?" And they can say yes or no. You bring up a great point. If you're an actor and you're listening to this, go talk to your estate lawyer right now mm -hmm. and put that in your will. I think that's a, that's a pretty smart piece of advice for the future that that is ahead of us. I'm also glad that you brought up that commercial. I didn't think about it. But I do know that this is not going to be limited. It already isn't limited to the world of film and TV. Music mm -hmm. events have happened sure. using characters that were more or less just projected. And, you know, they call them holograms. They're not exactly. I mean, they've done that with Tupac. I know that there's a, an entire like Japanese anime character, I think, or performer that you know tours worldwide and is, is nothing more than projection. And I think they did it with, with Ronnie James Dio recently, which is really interesting wow. to me. And I, I, you know, I was listening to, um, to Sirius XM and one of the DJs on there was just talking about, it's like, you, you better be ready because it, 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 it Jimi Hendrix is coming. Right. Expect all of that stuff. That's a weird one too. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about sitting in a, in a concert venue and, and listening to music being performed by someone who's just a ghost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
and who well, who's I definitely mean, I, not alive. I can say I would not pay money to go watch Jimi Hendrix's hologram. <laughs> I mean, I mean, honestly, because like okay. th- the money I'm going to pay for a ticket, I won't be able to tell who it is anyway. So if he's not actually yeah. playing the guitar, then what's the point of me <laughs> buying that ticket? Would you rather see the Jimi Hendrix cover band or the Jimi Hendrix hologram? Hmm. Well, the ticket prices are even. They're like ten bucks. Okay, let's. See. You have to pick one right now. <laughs> oh, you love the Pixies. I know that about you. Let's say Frank Black dies. God forbid. Don't say that. You go watch the Pixies cover band, or do you go watch the the Pixies with the Frank Black hologram? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would go see the hologram. <laughs> I mean, if you if you have if you have a gun to my head, okay. I just wanted to get this on record. Well, yeah, I mean, that is a very good point because I've listened to enough Pixies and Frank Black to know if I'm listening to Frank Black or not. So, like, if there's something even yeah. a little bit off about a cover band, I'm be like, this this is not. Yeah. These ain't my guys. Well, let's bring this back to Star Wars. Okay. You know, it's really interesting in that world specifically where there's a ton. I mean, there's nothing but CGI and makeup characters. And, sure. you know, correct me if I'm wrong. But, well, Kenny Baker was R2-D2, right? Right. He's dead, right? Uh, as th- That's what they'd like <laughs> us to believe. <laughs> I know. These are big Star Wars nerds. But, yeah. you know, R2-D2 and C-3PO have an appearance in Rogue One. Alan Tudyk. Love that actor. He yes. played, uh, was it KSO or whatever? You know, the main droid mm-hmm. in that movie. Uh, Andy Serkis has been talked about. He should be nominated for an Oscar for playing Smeagol and King Kong and the Planet of the Apes guys using motion capture. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Like, to me, it's, it's I, I try to, I, I do think it, it's definitely a difference when you're using someone's face who is not with us. Yes. But... You know, if I'm looking at it from a devil's advocate, it's all artifice. Like, you know, all of it. Sure. He's dead. Who cares? Like, you know, I mean, honestly, like, you know, you're you're funneling money into their estate. Their family gets it. It doesn't yeah. ultimately matter. As long as all the financials are on the up and up, then, I mean, yeah, it doesn't bother me as a viewer yeah. at all. Any more than it would bother me to watch a movie from the 30s where all the actors are dead now. Right. You know, you're, yeah, that's a good point. I'm not watching. You know, I'm watching a, a record of of something. I'm not. I'm watching fictional characters, I guess. So no, that doesn't bother me yet. Although I, at the same time, I'll say this: I don't think that the effects are at the point yet where it's completely convincing. We still have that uncanny valley to deal with. Like when I look at director Krennic and I look at Tarkin in that movie, I know exactly who's really in the room, at least judging by the face. So, you know, it's it's very cool. You know, if, if a story calls for something like that, it's great that we have the technology to do it at this point. But yeah, it's still not uh, not all the way there. And what about uh, Leia? What about that little moment there at the end? It was fine. When I saw it, it was shortly after she had just died. So, Me too. you know, I got the lump in the throat. I like the fact that we ended with, with that dialogue about hope, which kind of tied into other things in the movie. Like that was a nice touch. But there's a part of me that just felt like, I don't know, like, like it, it's it's jarring, not in a great way. Gotcha. To me. But that's, that's, that's my own feeling. What about you? Well, you know, and it's interesting. I don't think I've seen anything, of, and maybe I just need to look, where she's commented on that. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, maybe she just didn't have the chance. But yeah, it'd be interesting to know what she thought of them doing that. Yeah. You know, when I'm sure she found out and gave mm-hmm. her a blessing. Here's a question for you, though. Let's say somebody wants to make a sequel to Casablanca, Citizen Kane. And now they're going to do that by digitally recreating those faces of the original actors. Would you? <laughs> how would you feel about that? I mean, is it, you know, at the end of the day, does it just kind of come down to the, to the story? Or was that something that you think you could easily get on board that's a, <laughs> with as a viewer? Yeah, that, that's, that's definitely a loaded one. Because I think Mm -hmm. naturally if someone said Casablanca 2, I'd say, no way. (laughs) Like that is not a movie. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that's your initial reaction. So it's like, I I mean, I, I I can imagine that there could be a sequel that would be tantalizing enough that it'd be like, oh, wow. But I still feel like, honestly, even even if I was excited about the idea of the sequel to the movie, I think I would still naturally say to myself, it's going to look 
like I'm watching a bunch of CGI people. Like it's not going to be convincing in the least. Right. So, well, I won't say in the least because it's it's become pretty convincing, but it's not going to be convincing. Like that's the thing. Like it's not going to be the same. I'd okay. rather watch new actors carry on the roles at this point. And I think the the ultimate disclaimer yeah. is at this point because they're pretty yeah. close. I mean, they're they're definitely yeah. close. I think it'd be interesting if if they start remaking movies and they want to remake them exactly the same way, but with you know the characters uh, that they have to resurrect with CGI, and that gets so good that eventually they just re-release the movies and say it's a new movie. <laughs> And nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows, and they make nobody millions knows. off of it. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you. Since we're on the subject of ethics in film, this mm. very special episode of mm. Never Heard of It. Uh, you sent me an article just uh, about people's perceptions of piracy and, and the effects that it has, and I guess just generally just how little... They care mm-hmm. <laughs> if if studio is is losing money because of that or not. I don't. I mean, do you think that that argument against it is just is it dead in the water? I mean, is there a tide that can be turned, or is there that is just we're not putting that genie back in the bottle? It, it, well, in terms of convincing people not to pirate it, or, or that they really should care, you know? Yeah, because it, I think it gets harder every day. Because of young people moving into finding movies online, and that's how sure. they find legit movies online. Mm-hmm. And so, for them to be able to distinguish the difference, and I'll tell you, the worst practitioner of this is freaking YouTube, where sure. uh, the movie we're going to talk about next week, I watched it on that, which I'm sure was not, you know, there was no money going to the director yes. <laughs> and any of the people involved. But it was there, and that's a certainly a legal site, and they mm-hmm. have paid content on that site. This just didn't happen to be it. I don't know what you do about that, if anything. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the bottom line is if, if you are watching a movie and you're not paying for it, essentially you are stealing it from someone. Agreed. Not that it you know fully excuses us, but the movie that we're talking about next week, which is Get Crazy, which you should check out, uh, you're probably only on going to be able to check it out on YouTube <laughs> because it's only yeah. been released on VHS. Yep. You know, and, and that's like that's the sort of thing that I would that I tend to look for are the movies that are not available. For me, if it's available somewhere, then I know I can get to it one way or another. I I, I think anyone who's just going home every weekend and and downloading every movie that was just released, that's clearly terrible. And if that's what you're doing, that's not great. And uh, I frown on it much less if it's, I don't know, like a, a, a poor kid at school who uh, has no money to go out. Then I'm like, eh, fine. But uh, I know that's not all the pirates <laughs> at all. No, of course At not. the same time, like the question of whether or not I feel bad that a huge corporation is losing money... You're going to say no, because that's, yeah, if you position, and I I was curious if that's, if the survey is like, okay, well, yeah, if you're positioning it this way, you know, none of these studios are independently owned anymore. They're all like, yeah, part of conglomerates. Right. Yeah, of course, 30% of the people are going to say, yeah, I don't really, I'm not losing sleep over them. Right. (laughs) You know, handing out residuals for stuff they made a billion dollars off of. I kind of can't tell if, if, if the question, because the question is not, do you feel bad about stealing stuff? Right. Like, do you feel bad that that the money that they should be getting they're not getting? Mm-hmm. That is pretty amazing though. Almost half of the people who pirate. So, and, and I guess you know the the idea then being that they feel like it's totally fine. So that's that, well, that is that is pretty startling. And I mean, and and I they don't really go into, I don't think, how much money is necessarily lost, mm-hmm. which would have been a nice little uh, stat to throw in here. Sure. Yeah. Because if it's like, oh, this, this like, you know, takes $1 million out of their bottom line every year, kind of be like, how do they even notice that? I think, you know, the biggest argument that made an impact on me for torrenting was I took a trip to the Dominican Republic and spoke with somebody there. And he was like, look, I can't escape hearing about Iron Man 
it's not showing up here in theaters for another two months. Right. But I can find it online right now today. Yeah. You know, as as somebody who's like making these things, I, I understand that. Like, you know, yeah. I, I want you to see the movie, you know, and the rest of the world is watching it. And I think they've got better about that. You know, now you, you see that they're releasing movies in China and Russia and other places before they even release them in America. These sure. you know, some very huge movies. I think that helps. And um, I, I think also it's still a little complicated to find those like illegal movies and then, you know, I honestly, God, like I've tried before for this podcast and like never found something that I'm like, I don't understand. Yeah. Like what I had to download, like some other piece of software just to open this file. And then like, I had to copy, like, how do I get this on my TV? You know? Yeah. <laughs> and so the um, whole thing is, is, is really sketchy as hell. And, and you know, like right. I, I know a few people who say, oh yeah, like, like I've watched this whole series on this website you know, some blah, 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 some website. And like, I go to the website and I feel like it's like virus city. Like if I stay here for 10 more <laughs> seconds, I'm not going to have a computer. Yeah. But, but apparently that's like, like there's pirated stuff streaming. I mean, you don't really even have to tour in it, you know, it's like, right. Yeah. It's straight up streaming and you can watch anything you want to. But, but the other thing for me is the quality of what you get is so poor Right. That for me, I, I like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. Like, that's not how I want to watch any of these movies. Like, like, I mean, half of them are, you know, the old fashioned pirated movies that someone took a video camera into the theater and shot it. You know, and it's just like I don't want to watch a movie like that. That's terrible. But on some of the older stuff, I think the good and bad of that is you'll have a 4K screen on your laptop yeah. if you don't already, um, very, very soon. Yeah. And so watching something that's even at like. 480p on youtube which is you know that's basically dvd revolution uh, resolution right mm -hmm. if you're a kid you know you're 13 14 now and like yeah you've got like a 4k tv in your basement or whatever and you're streaming this stuff you can go on back and watching something you know uh inside band or something that, that we've yeah. watched on this podcast that, that looks like crap and it's a crappy transfer and it's a crappy resolution being streamed I don't know if they're going to even want to sit through that. Yeah. And so I, I think like that, that just, man, it makes it so much more important to like archive and restore these movies and have some sort of system in place for that, where I think like a, you know, something like, you know, Turner Classic Music, uh, movies and some of those places and Filmstruck and whatnot, like these places, like get that whole library for people like us, like somebody yeah. find a way to make those deals happen and get something like get crazy out there in some sort of HD resolution. Agreed. I think people will pay for these things. Like if you can do it in the sort of buffet model of, yeah. of Netflix or Hulu or something like that, you know, I think people will still find and watch these movies. Well, you know, I think maybe let's just do a little wrapid round here of some yeah. stuff. Uh, we'll just we'll burn through some news real quick, and then we'll call it a night. I think the biggest news of the past two weeks, probably for me, is that the the Coen Brothers are making a, a TV western anthology series called The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Yes, it looks like it may have a theatrical release in some capacity, which would be really really interesting, depending on how long it is. Mm -hmm. I also did know apparently in 2011 they had an hour long TV movie uh, about a CD Los Angeles cop titled Harv Carbo. <laughs> Such a no Coen Brothers idea. name, I yeah. know, right? Uh, but you know, obviously, did not make didn't make it to the TV screens then. So very, very curious and excited to see what comes of that. Craig, we were talking about sequels. Uh, if I said there's an Eastern Promises sequel coming, what do you think about that? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I'd love to see anything from Cronenberg. Well, he's not directing this one. Oh, I felt the same way, but. Stephen Knight, who wrote the original script, he looks like he's going to direct this, and he I think he directed that movie Lock with uh, Tom Hardy that was just set in a car. Sure, that movie is great. I love that movie, so I'm I'm really excited. I, and he's involved in Peaky Blinders and uh, Taboo, this new show that's coming out. So it sounds like he's done a ton of stuff since then. Yeah, I didn't love that movie. That's the, the thing. The only thing I remember is that bathroom fight, that shower yeah. fight. We'll see. We'll keep an eye on that one. Did you get a chance to watch the trailer for The Discovery? I did, and I like it. Yeah, this is starring Jason Siegel, Rooney Mara, Robert Redford, Jesse Plemons. Yeah. Uh, I think it's going to be at Sundance, but it's coming out on Netflix. Here's a 
brief, brief synopsis. One year after the existence of the afterlife is scientifically verified, millions around the world have ended their own lives in order to get there. A man and woman fall in love while coming to terms with their own tragic past and the true nature of the afterlife. Uh, that's that's a pretty interesting concept. Yeah. The trailer looks looks interesting and creepy. Good use of music. Real creepy. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, we'll, we'll throw that up on uh, on the Facebook sitey site. Real, real quickly, Taste of Cinema posted a, a list of the 10 most underrated Hollywood directors of all time, and this was shared by Paul Schrader, um, which is where I saw it. But uh, I'll just run through them real quick, and we'll, we'll maybe comment on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, number 10, Tony Scott. Number 9, Walter Hill. Number 8, Paul Schrader. Number seven, Joel Schumacher. Number six, Michael Curtiz. Number five is, where is he? Don Siegel, Mr. Dirty Harry. Uh, William Wyler is number four. Number three, Richard Donner. Number two, Robert Zemeckis. Number one, Robert Wise. Uh, I think these lists are obviously meant to be debated, and that's why they publish them (laughs) on these sites. I would probably take issue with Zemeckis being on there at all, I guess. Having one, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't feel like any of these guys were necessarily underrated. Like maybe Don Siegel. I don't hear people talk about him very much, but yeah, uh, unless you're just saying like outside of film nerd circles, these guys are underrated because I feel like, I don't know, man, I've had conversations about every single one of these guys being great. Yeah, and I think Paul Schrader, I don't remember his, his line exactly about it, but when he posted it, he made some comment on that and the fact that, you know, Joel Schumacher, you know, he was being compared to Joel Schumacher yeah. here. And, and uh Actually, if you don't follow Paul Schrader on Facebook, I highly recommend it. It's really interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Is there is there anybody that that just immediately comes to mind that you would rather see on this list? It's underrated. Uh, honestly, maybe uh, maybe the director of the movie we're talking about next week. Oh wow, Alan Arkush. Mm-hmm. I mean, this guy made movies that are singular. I mean, it, 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 it's yeah. it's the kind of thing where. Even even if the movie is is has sort of left the rails, there's not much of a story. Maybe you even you even might look at it and think, well, that looks like a piece of garbage. It's not, because I swear to God, uh, that guy loves everything he's doing so yeah. much. So I mean, that's the kind of person I might do it because I've never had a conversation about that guy. Yeah, I never you. even knew his name. Yeah, I don't. I don't have one. I just got yeah. blank. So <laughs> I, I feel like I don't really underrate too many directors honestly <laughs> that's really what it is yeah yeah i love them all i think they're all yeah, amazing they and they can do what i can't do so they'll never end up on my list anyway it'll be interesting to see if that list you know 20 years from now and we're still doing this podcast it might might be worth revisiting that list i'll keep it bookmarked uh that's all i got i think you know this was a fun one we got into some serious stuff got into some light stuff mm. would love to hear everyone else's opinions on specifically the use of CGI recreations of, of dead people. I think that's an endlessly fascinating and debatable subject that will continue to be debated as we go on. Right. And until then, join us next week. Yeah, we will be talking about the movie Get Crazy, and you can find that on YouTube. We'll, we'll throw up a link a couple days before the podcast drops. And uh, after that, we got some guests coming, so fun, fun. It's going to be a good year, y'all. Oh, I forgot. Oh. By the time this drops, we'll have a new president. Anything you want to go on record as predicting that we can revisit four years from now? <laughs> I have. I, there's, I can't predict anything about this anymore. You, you go ahead. I'm going to predict that Trump will stop using Twitter. Wow. Okay, I'll I go. Know, I know. That, that's a pretty bold prediction. I, I, th- think. I that's think That's about it is. all I'm really hopeful for right now. That would be no small thing. I think he will. I think he'll stop. Uh, or, uh, okay, he'll either stop or his account will get hacked and he'll kind of be forced to stop. Okay. What do you think the odds are that in four years Trump is not our president? Uh, low. Low. I just, I think the, rea- the reality of that is, is always low. Uh, I feel, I feel nobody's like Nobody's going right. to be in a hurry to, nobody's going to be in a hurry to oust the president. But that's a pretty bold prediction, Craig, if you want to go on record as making it. Uh, well, I'm not going to make that prediction. My prediction will be that in four okay. years, uh, Donald, Donald Trump will be bald. 100% Ooh, wow. cue okay. ball bald. Being president is one of the worst things you can do to your physical appearance. Oh, man. So, uh, yeah, it destroys yeah. you. And I think he'd, he'd do good with sort of a Lex Luthor type of thing. <laughs> I think he'd find that somehow fits. So, yeah, if Trump is bald or he has no Twitter account, you'll hear about it here in four years. Yeah, and you'll, you won't stop hearing about it. All right, y'all. Bye.